All right. Good morning. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm happy to have a few community, community members here. That's great. Um, thank you for joining. Um, so today we'll talk about um, how flow internally within the nodes, messages, and just events generally could be passed around, our current patterns of how they are passed around, and maybe what to pay attention to, and um, a few recommendations. Um, so I have slides, but I think it's probably nevertheless worthwhile for people to just interrupt with any questions. So this is more sort of a guided slide, guided discussion than um, a, a proper talk. So by all means, if you have questions, please just raise your hand and ask. All right. So, um, so this graph, what you see here at the top, that is a relatively recent proposal from Ramtin. Um, one of the core protocol members, um, how the execution node could look in the future in a more model, uh, modularized sort of software design. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail on how this particular graph looks like, but um, what I would like you to notice is that there are essentially two sort of things happening here, right? There's those, um, there's those uh, boxes here, which are components that do stuff, and then there are arrows which uh, represent information exchange, so information going from one component to a different one. It's directed, right? One, one person is speaking and, the, uh, and one or more people are listening. Um, so for instance here, right? So we see that execute block produces some information, the computation result, and it's, um, and it's consumed by uh, three other consumers here in this, in this graph. All right. Um, so uh, this generally falls under the very, very broad category of uh, event-driven systems. So right, uh, some, s something says something, and in response to this being said, uh, somebody else does. That's an event-driven system. Um, there are relatively many uh, design patterns for event-driven systems. I was relatively surprised um, how uh, to, to see what sort of nuances there are and um, sort of what um, what concepts people uh, people emphasize, um, but in the end, it, it always comes back to the same basics. Um, so one of the basic things you usually have is an event stream. So that's um, that's yeah, just sort of a, a pipeline um, through which you can send information. So that pipeline typically has a name, or that stream typically has a name, um, which we can uh, refer to. Um, via, via that name to, to the stream. Um, it transports a pre-specified set of typed events, um, and uh, it's generally order preserving, right? So the, in the same order as the, the publisher produces the events, all the consumers get it, which is a relatively nice or a very important nice feature um, because a lot of the things we do are order dependent. Um, and the way how to think about that is, um, uh, or the way how to think about an event stream is um, that it's just a physical wire. There's no logic, no memory, nothing. The only thing it does is distribute information. Um, and the other, the other building block here are processing components. They have a local state. Um, they manage their own threads. They do stuff, right? They compute things. Um, and they ingest um, some specific um, event streams. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, it's a priori clear when you create, instantiate such a component, what event streams it would like to, to consume. And it's, it also says which event streams it's going to produce. Um, and so, and there's one sort of, you don't, it doesn't always have to be that way, but in our, um, in our conventions, um, this is a, this is an important sort of basic convention that for each event stream, there's a unique producer. One block here produces the event stream and there's zero up to very many consumers, um, who listen to that and ingest all the events. So let's talk about the event streams and flow. Um, so an example here is our finalization event stream. Um, 
this is produced by the consensus component um, in the consensus node that's the component which actively participates in consensus for all the other node roles like access execution etc nodes um, the um, the finalization event stream is produced by the consensus follower so that's an engine which um, or a component which uh, follows what's happening in consensus and emits, verifies locally what's happening and then emits um, events which can be consumed by the other um, uh, by the other components within the same node um, to know that, for instance, now a block has been finalized and they can update something or that a new block has been received and they can start processing it. Um, so that's what the finalization event stream is generally good for. Um, so, uh, and, and those are the events you see here, right? It can say, hey, a block has been finalized. It can also, the, the finalization um, event stream can also say that a new block has been incorporated, meaning that the local consensus follower has now learned about a new block um, and uh, it's notifying the other components within the same node that that block can now be processed. Um, there's also like a specific sort of Byzantine attack which this uh, finalization consumer can notify about. Um, it scans and recognizes those attacks and emits such events, but um, yeah, for the happy pass only the block incorporated and blo finalized block events are sort of really relevant. Um, so, um, and if you look at this finalization event stream here as an example, right, it has a name, so it's a finalization here, you see that. Um, and uh, the, trans, uh, the spe specified set of transported events are listed here in that interface, right? They're strongly typed, which is really great because then the compiler helps us to recognize if we're sort of miswiring events. Um, and uh, yeah, that just produces a lot of very nice, strong guarantees for our code base that we're as humans not messing up anything accidentally. Um, so, uh yeah and so i said that in that you can can uh, think about an event stream as a wire there's the producer um the consensus component and then there are multiple consumers and so um when we dis uh, when we describe an event stream um we usually describe it from the perspective of the consumer right what does the consumer get if i subscribe to that uh, event stream what do i get and at events and respectively, what functions do I have to implement to consume this event stream, right? So if I'm a consumer, I have to implement, oops, sorry, I have to implement those three, those three um, methods. Um, and then I'm able to subscribe to that event stream. Um, so we describe the event stream um, from, or at least, sorry, we describe the set of events from the perspective of the consumer. And we have the convention, generally, that's a software convention, that a consumer ingests all events. So when you want that finalization event stream, you have to implement all three methods. Um, I mean, you can just stub them out with an empty body, right? Um, that, is uh, that essentially means that the consumer doesn't do anything with, the, with that event, but still getting it from, from the stream. Um, so so that's, um, that's the set of events. Um, and now let's look at how that looks for the producer. Um, so the producer here on this end, um, uh, yeah, so the producer essentially, um, w when you're implementing a producer, you would like some sort of component where you can just dump your events in, right? You, you want to call a method like, oh, um, on finalized block. And then you don't want to care how, how this, from the perspective of the producer, how those events are, um, are distributed to all the consumers. Um, so, and how we generally implement that in Flow is that we have those distributor structures, uh, structs. They, um, they're, because this is a multi-threaded context, um, they have a lock, right, to, to mediate um, concurrent access. Um, and then they just keep a simple slice of all the um, of all the finalization consumers, right? So this is essentially here implementing the wire that finalization distributor struct is implementing the, the blue wire here, um, and so it uh, it states here it implements a finalization consumer interface what we've seen in the previous slide, um, 
And to this wire, you can add additional consumers. So, you know, if you only have consumers A and B, then you can, then consumer C can add itself um, to, uh, to receiving those events um, or receiving the event stream. Um, and it does that when, or with calling the add consumer method. Um, and so the consumer has to implement also the finalization consumer interface. Um, yeah. And when somebody subscribes to the event stream, we just simply add it um, here to the, uh, to the list of uh, consumers. Um, what you'll notice here is that there's no unsubscribe method because generally we, in, in essentially all of our cases, this wiring is static, right? When the node sort of boots up, it, it as part of constructing, um, as part of constructing the, the node internal components, um, the scripts, uh, subscription happens, but usually components don't unsubscribe. Maybe we add that later as part of crash recovery where um, we only have individual components crashing, not the entire node, but for the moment, um, consumers just subscribe, right? And they'll get, they'll get all the notification and if something goes wrong, then the entire node crashes and is rebuilt from scratch. Um, and so this building a node, assembling a node when it boots up, um, this is done by our node builder. We have node builders for every node role, yeah. Um, and so uh, the node builder, the first thing it does is constructs a finalization distributor. So it essentially first constructs a wire, um, and then um, it injects this um, the producer end of the uh, the wire into the producer. So how that looks for us specifically is that um, uh, the node builder first builds a finalization distributor, then it builds a consensus follower and injects a finalization distributor into the consensus follower. And um, also the producer, the consensus follower, um, works with the with the abstract interface type. So it doesn't care that there is this um, this finalization distributor under the hood, which essentially can sort of distribute the events to multiple consumers. It could also just be a single wire if that's easier. And you know, for the moment, you don't have any. Um, you only have one consumer. Then you can just implement a single wire, right? Um, but the important part is that um, the, uh, um, the producing end is injected in the, into the producer while the consumers dynamically subscribe to it. So that's sort of an implementation pattern, right? Um, injection versus publication subscription. Um, yeah. So the last, um, the last property of an event stream is that it is order preserving. So let's take a look how this is manifested in the code. Um, so when the produ producer calls the unfinalized block, so that's the message the producer calls to, um, uh, yeah, that's the message the producer calls to uh, emit an event. Um, it calls the unfinalized block. Um, what you can see here is that we simply just loop over all the consumers, right, and just call unfinalized block on the consumer. So we essentially propagate just the call to the consumer. Um, this is, has virtually zero runtime overhead, um, and you can do that many times. So you can stack that, that th those producers, uh, sorry, you can stack those, um, those distributors if you would like. Um, you can also introduce uh, producers which only propagate two out of three events if you would like to. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility on how to implement this wire, um, but uh, the, the the basic pattern is a pop up pattern, right? Um, and so um, I already mentioned that the pop up pattern. Um, so why do we do that? Why the pop up pattern, right? Um, a, a alternative design could be to just work with injection, right? So uh, um, when whenever you construct something, you inject all the consumers. That's the, that's the design we, we started initially with, um, where we just injected everything. And that turned out to be quite complicated um, and produce a lot of weird designs because a lot of cases you have cyclic, um, cyclic information flow, right? As in this example here, um, there's a protocol overseer, the protocol overseer um, um, 
send some information to the scheduler. The scheduler eventually um, responds uh, with, uh, to this information as well as other inputs by emitting uh, other events, which are then again consumed by the protocol overseer. So you see you have a cycle here, right? And you can't build that with injection, at least not in Golang, um, because it will complain about cyclic dependencies and not compile. Um, and so um, the only way out of this uh, with sort of clean software design is to use PubSub, right? Um, and that's the reason why we use PubSub everywhere um, or for all the wires. We say it's always the same thing. If you have a wire, it's a PubSub construct. Sorry, one, one sip of water. Yeah, um, and so one benefit is um, that pops up uh, very nicely organically deals with uh, circular information flow. The other very nice um, property is that it organically deals with many consumers. That's also a case we have a lot of times where you first implement something and there's only one or two consumers um, here on the wire and then later on you realize, oh, but another component would benefit from receiving that information too. Maybe I just want to log it, right? And if you want to log it, you just implement a simple other consumer, a logging consumer, and subscribe that to the uh, to the event stream. Um, so that makes the code very extensible, very well maintainable. Um, it's relatively simple what's happening on the wire. Um, so, okay. Um, so now let's 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 do a little thought experiment here, right? Um, the goal of this this um, this discussion here is to um, also explain not only what we do, but also explain why we do it that way. Um, and a lot of those things we've thought of had to learn the hard way, right? We first started with with more maybe less structured design patterns, and then realized, oh, this becomes messy really quickly. Um, so. Um, so you might ask the question, well, um, so I have this pops up thing here, right here, and um, I say don't put any logic in there. No memory, no, no, no threads, nothing. Um, why not, right? Um, because if I'm the producer and I produce events, um, let me go back, right? If I'm the producer and I produce events, I call this unfinalized block here. This unfinalized block just under the hood calls um, on finalized block on all the consumers. What happens if one of the consumers does something more time intensive? It blocks, or I don't know, um, just takes a few milliseconds to produce, uh, sorry, to, to process that, on, uh, that call. Um, well, then I block my producer, um, and that is not nice. Um, and so you need this relatively strong convention that all the consumers do not block. Um, they return more or less immediately. Um, and you might ask, well, okay, uh, so we have this strong convention that no one, no, none of the consumers is to block. Can't I just sort of put, put a little bit of extra logic in the wire so that I don't always have to worry about this non-blocking when I implement a consumer, right? Um, the, the wire takes care of this for me as a framework. So that's sort of the thought experiment we want to do. We want to think, about, think this through and see where, where we end up, right? And what sort of the trade-offs are of fo potentially following this alternative design pattern. Um, we will see that it has a lot of drawbacks and that's the reason why we're ending up with uh, this design pattern where we say, do not put any logic on the, on the wire. All right, so for now we're assuming we're happy putting logic on the wire, right? And what we want to do is we want to remove that extra requirement of consumers can't block. So um, if you put a worker pool in our, in, in our pops up components on the distributor here, um, then um, the producer can just call into the, into the pops up component and say, hey, I have new events, distribute them for me. And the pops up component itself has its own worker pool and can therefore simply distribute those events even if those consumers block, great. Right, so now now we don't have to wor worry about blocking consumers anymore. Oops, sorry. Design what? So what's the downside of this? Right. So we have the worker pool here. Well, the downside is um, first, if you have a worker pool here and you just feed in ten events, right, um, and there are ten threads, then each of those threads 
in the worker pool will grab one event and distribute it. And you have a race condition in which order they, they'll deliver that event to the consumer. So you have out of order delivery of events. That is really not good because in most cases you want in order delivery. Um, you want order preserving delivery. Um, the other problem is it makes your entire design vulnerable to BFT attacks because uh, if somebody like, remember, this is all open source, right? So everyone can look at your code. Um, and so um, if somebody sees that and they're like, oh, there's only this worker pool. Um, and I know um, that the consumer that year, right, that blocks and it potentially blocks quite a while. So if I manage to get enough events emitted from the producer that consumer that um, consumes and uh, blocks, then I can get all my worker threats tied up here, right? Um, because they're all waiting here to deliver the events um, uh, for, from, from the producer. Um, and since all those worker threats delivering the events are tied up in, at the consumer, queued here at the consumer Z waiting to deliver their events, they can't deliver any new events to consumer W. And if consumer W, for instance, our consensus engine is waiting for new blocks, but not getting them because consumer Z monopolizes all the, the resources, um, all the threats in the worker pool, right? Then I, then, uh, I as an attacker, by, by producing a lot of events for consumer Z, I can starve consumer W um, from getting new information. So I can essentially mount a resource exhaustion attack on the node quite efficiently. And since we have many of those wires, um, there are many, uh, many options for you as an attacker to attack the system that way. Um, and so those two properties, right, that uh, this design one here um, produces out of order event delivery and it's vulnerable to BFT attacks, doesn't quite make it very suitable for our, for, for our uh, use case here for implementing a flow node. Um, all right, so let's let's modify this event or sorry this design. Um, the main problem here was that we only had one worker pool, right? And if that worker pool gets starved, all the consumers uh, potentially are affected. So one po potential mitigation strategy would be to put more worker pools in all those sort of consumers, right? Uh, so not only the top level consumer um, has its own worker pool, all consumers have their own worker pool. Great. So now we're, um, we've gotten rid of this problem that if one consumer blocks, um, all the other consumers get starved. So that doesn't happen anymore, right? Because events which flow in from the producer are distributed by this worker pool, who then forwards them to those worker pools. And um, since uh, there, we could even put a worker pool here around the consumer, right? And then um, there are enough threads available for, to serve the consumers and as well forward uh, to the other consumers, right? Um, the downside is now your event for being delivered passes through three, three context changes, right? Each time it goes from one worker pool to a different one, um, your, your machine under the hood has to pass that from one thread potentially to a different thread, right? And that requires context switches, flashes of caches, um, and that costs you time um, or costs the CPU resources. So you have a lot of context switches which are undesirable. Um, they negatively impact performance. Um, you have, Im imagine you have like 100 threads, uh, sorry, 100 wires in your system, then you have many, many, many hundreds of, of Go routines just to, to do those wires. Um, and uh, so overall that amounts to quite amount of sort of also maintenance overhead for, for the programming environment for Golang um, to, to maintain all your Go routines. Um, and the third, uh, and, and the remaining problem of out of order delivery of events is still not solved. Great, or not great. So also not uh, a, a super suitable design. All right, so what's the third design? The third design is, well, no worker pools in any, anywhere in the wire and only worker pools on the consumers. Um, so w w where do we end up with this design? Um, so you have no concurrency cost because uh, delivering the events because you don't do any context switches, right? Um, all those deliveries here, like going down, going down the wire, that all happens in the 
and the producer threat, right? It's just literally just calling um, on the consumer the respective method. There's virtually no overhead. So that's super, super efficient um, delivering the events. Um, furthermore, since that all happens in the producer thread, if the producer produces the, uh, the events in a specific order, they will be delivered to the consumer in exactly that order, right? How the producer produces, produces the events, that's how the consumer gets it. Um, that's also super great um, and uh, relatively intuitive, right? When, when you subscribe to an event or to an event stream, you get the events in the order they're, they're produced. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that, that, that fits both of our requirements, right? It's, it's both efficient as well as order preserving. So that's the reason why we go with this design. What you've seen, uh, what I've said before, um, is that the wires are just dumb wires and the consumers um, worry about what they do when they get the events. They have to locally queue them and make sure that they don't block. Um, so that's a relatively simple requirement. Consumers don't block. Um, and with this simple requirement and the guideline of not putting any logic on the wire, you have a very intuitive, very for straightforward design which delivers you or which has a lot of strong guarantees, which is for, uh, most importantly in order delivery or order preserving delivery of events. Um, yes. I already said that, that all, exactly all consumers must be uh, non-blocking and of course threat safe, right? Um, because the publisher also might publish events and multiple threats. That could happen, right? In which, in which cases the consumer gets events from multiple threats. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, so this is a summary um, of our conventions here. Very simple, consumers ingest all events of a stream they subscribe to and uh, consumer implementations are non-blocking. They locally queue, filter, drop um, events depending on their local specific use case, right? Like one consumer here might have a totally different policy of dropping events when they're overwhelmed than a different consumer. So that's, you know, how, how to deal with a too strong influx of events, that's totally the business of the consumer and not the business of the wire. Okay, so um, I think, yeah, the next uh, next slide I'll go talk a little bit more in detail about the consumers, but I, or uh, sorry, the, the, the components, so um, the things uh, with, that actually do stuff. Um, but there, exactly, thank you, Jan, I wanted to ask if there are questions. So how do we enforce um, that consumers are non-blocking. Well, um, unfortunately, Go doesn't give us any um, any language uh, language guarantees. Um, we just write that. So we just write that generally in the API. It just becomes part of the API convention here, right? So the finalization consumer. That's the interface the consumer has to implement. And if you look here, um, right? Oops. It says, ah, here, it says for each method, implementation must be concurrency safe and non-blocking. It's a similar requirement as requiring a certain component to be concurrency safe, right? You can't really enforce that. Um, you, you clearly document that in the API, right? It's a short, short sort of documentation. It doesn't cost the engineers too much to really write it down. Um, everyone understands what that means. Um, and uh, it's, it, it results in a very intuitive design. So to some extent, we have to rely on documentation and can't, can't enforce everything with language constructs. Um, yeah, that's a little bit the trade-off here. Um, that, did that answer your question, Jan? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what about the malicious behavior. Like if I want to block the producer, I can just block and then, uh, you know, how we, do, how we deal with that scenario? So, mm, thank you, very good question. Um, let me go back to this one here. Um, so remember that the entire thing we're discussing here um, are communication with, uh, of different components within the same node, right? So this entire thing here is one execution node instance, right? An execution node has all those components locally. Um, 
And um, so, so that means within the node, right, we assume that components are honest. Um, I mean, of course, there are bugs, right? Um, but there is no, like, it won't happen that the scheduler will try to, for instance, spam the protocol overseer. Somebody can try to spam the scheduler, right? And you can think about, well, how do I make the scheduler not affect the other components? Um, but um, the, uh, the, the, the protocol overseer doesn't really have to worry about purposefully malicious behavior of the scheduler, because as soon as you're on the node, it's probably anyway game over, right? Um, that, uh, and and uh, so, so either this entire node the, the entire software for the node was provisioned by an honest um, node operator, in which case the individual components don't have to worry about other components within their node being malicious. Or it's just um, the, the, the software has been provisioned by a malicious node operator, but then we also don't really care whether the, the individual components within the malicious node are nicely collaborating, right? Um, we don't care about that. Is that. Did that answer your question, Jan? Not quite sure. Yeah, so 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 yeah, I, yeah, it totally does. But so so we are we are using some other mechanisms when we are talking about messaging between nodes in the network, right? Exactly. So um, <clears throat> so um, when how we pass the messages from the networking layer to the first component, right? So you you might see here there's this arrow saying collections. Right. So, and those those go into the scheduler. So this would be an information coming from the outside. And there's a different mechanism, yes. Um, so um, components directly subscribe with the networking layer um, for, it's a similar concept um, as, um, uh, as um, the, the, the pops up model we've described here. But when you consume events from the networking layer or messages from the networking layer, there's only one consumer. Not, not many, right? So for each event stream, there's only one consumer. It, it subscribes directly with the networking layer, and it has a, it has a different interface and a different mechanic. So we've it's it's essentially implemented completely separately, and so that also allows for really really easy differentiation of am I dealing with something which is coming from the outside into my node, or is this something which was emitted by a different component? Of course different components can get overwhelmed and produce a lot of notifications. You know, you have to deal with that, but it's a priori clear that that is a different, um, it's, it's essentially coming from a trusted source um, versus outside of the node is a non-trusted source. Great. All right, um, are, there, are there more questions? No. Then um, let's uh, go on to to looking into our processing components. So how do how how do those little boxes here work, right? Here. Those little boxes. What are the little boxes? Um, the things that do stuff. They're they're the processing components. Um, so processing components have local state, they manage their own threads, um, they have a predefined set of um, event streams that they ingest, and they um, have a predefined set of event streams that they produce. Um, and so here I would like to talk a little bit more about, um, let's say, more, more, broader, more broader context. So I specifically like to talk about what it means to implement an information-driven system. So each component implements an information-driven subsystem. So yeah, so, so let's, let's talk about what that actually means. Um, and again, let's do, a little, let's do a little thought experiment here um, to just illustrate right, what, what happens. So um, imagine you have a little person at the edge of a cliff. Um, uh, this is very similar to, you might know those jokes where one person standing at the cliff and there's another person asking uh, or, or taking a photo, and the person taking a photo is tells the person standing next to the cliff, please take a st step back, and the person falls off the cliff, right? Very well-known joke. In fact, that joke tells us some, something about software engineering practices. So what it tells us is that if you communicate in terms of state deltas, state changes, 
you you end up in a relatively risky scenario, right? So um, so this is one possible communication pattern here to the left. We communicate in terms of state changes. So one command would be move one meter forward, right? If that person moves a meter forward, it falls off the cliff. Um, and so those commands, um, they're not idempotent. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit what idempotent means more formally. Um, so that means if you tell the person twice, one, move one meter for, forward, that is something different than telling it only once. So this is here is a concatenation symbol. Move one meter forward, concatenated with move one meter forward is, is moving two meters forward, right? That's unequal to moving one meter forward. Um, and so this is the definition of not idempotent. Idempotent here is that's this definition that I um, concatenated with I itself is, is again I. Um, and, and, and this is this is not the case. That's 2C, move two meters forward, right? So that's not idempotent. Um, and this communication behavior is generally relatively complex and bug prone. Um, so because if you have a person here giving commands to that person on the cliff, right? That person giving the commands, the commander, has to have quite precise knowledge about what the state of the executing entity is. Um, so you need more or less an atomic, um, atomic, ast atomic state knowledge, right? Um, it, it, as soon as uh, uh, the, the, the person on the cliff moves, the commander has to know that they have moved, and as soon as the commander has to has issued a command, it needs to know whether the recipient has received it and executed it or not, right? Because specifically for that for that problem, that if you say something again, um, it leads to a different state. The commands are not idempotent, um, and so and so this this requires a very very tight coupling between the commander and 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 the person executing the commands um and that is that tight coupling means you need to you need to atomically maintain maintain shared state between multiple components that is prone to congestion and it's complex for us as humans to really sort of make sure that we ha we know understand all the couplings right because if you if you have one commander and multiple entities receiving the commands, right, you suddenly have to share atomic state or maintain atomic state between many components. Um, and for us as humans, that's complex to track all those dependencies. What do I break if I change something, right? If, what, if I change something in the producer, what do I potentially break with all the consumers? Um, and so that's fast as humans to write this code that is relatively prone to subtle bugs. Um, so an information-driven system works slightly differently. It's subtle, but it's very, very important. So the information is you describe the end state where you want the producer to be. You don't describe the state change, right? We don't say move one meter forward. We say move like one meter before the edge of the cliff here, right? And if I say, say that to you twice, right, that doesn't make a change, right? If I tell you, hey, today is March 16th, and I repeat that three times, that's not harmful for you. You're like, yeah, I understood that. Maybe I'm wasting your time, but I don't sort of get you in a in a in a broken state, right? And so, um, and this so so this is essentially a different way of saying that information is idempotent. So telling you the same thing twice does not make a difference. That's as good as telling it to you only once. Um, and so this is a relaxation, right? We're, we're essentially saying the consumer is fine with repeated information. Um, uh, and that allows the producer um, who is producing those information things to, to not worry about whether you've already heard something or not, right? It can just tell it to you a second time. In the worst case, it's wasting a few, of the, a few CPU cycles. Um, and so this is relatively intuitive. If you're, if you're implementing a producer, Right? You don't have to worry whether your consumers have already heard about this or not. Um, and, um, it's, yeah, and it's resilient to uh, repetitions, meaning that it eliminates a vast um, area for bugs, um, which we have in, this, uh, in, in the, uh, the non-information-driven way. Um, so, so this is my strong recommendation 
when you implement components within flow nodes, implement them as, uh, as information driven systems that will make your life so much easier and the life of every other engineer working with your code um, because it creates a strong decoupling between the different components. All right. Um, so, uh, well, okay, before I go on to the next topic, um, are there any questions about this? Okay. Oh, there is one. Janes, go ahead. Um, I suppose the order of information still matters. If I tell you move one meter before the cliff, and then I say move one, two meters before the cliff, and then I resend the move one meter before the cliff, that's different than if I said you know, move one meter before the cliff twice, and then said the move two meters before the cliff. Yes. Yes, the order, of course, the order matters. Um, and if you repeat larger chunks of sort of history, that might cause the consumer to also repeat some of his work, right? Like if I'm a robot and you're controlling my arm, right? Um, and you have crashed and don't remember where my arm is, right? And you want my arm to go on top of my head, stupid example, but I don't know, you know, just for the matter of it. Um, so. Uh, if you crash as a controller and you don't remember that my arm is here, you might say, well, put your arm in the parking position, right? And then you say, move your arm up again and then move it onto your head, right? The end state where my arm ends up on my head is still the same, even though you've uh, you've sort of consumed a few additional uh, moving cycles from, from me as a robot, right? By first moving my arm back and then and then moving my arm up again where it already was. So you've, you've consumed a few extra cycles, um, but in many cases, this is not harmful, right? Um, this typically only happens, so repetition of information usually only happens at startup, right? The component has crashed, lost some of its memory of what has happened before and is reissuing some of the information. Um, and so, and during startup, you know, like if our execution node crashes, it anyway already takes a few minutes to come back up. So, uh, you know, adding a few extra CPU cycles and repeating a little bit of work is of no harm. Um, and, uh, uh, and then once the information is up and running, right, usually the producer also, they don't, a lot of times they don't produce events like very many or very many times um, during, during like happy operations. Does that make sense, Janus? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Um, I, I was debating whether I put should put that on the slide, but I was hoping that somebody would ask the question. Thank you. Um, and so that we have an opportunity to talk about it. Great. OK. Next slide. Um, so uh, I've, I've previously mentioned that all those components, so those boxes here, that they keep local state. Um, and um, a question which frequently comes up is like, okay, um, so let's say um, components need to know what the latest finalized height is, like the follower, right? That knows what the latest finalized height is because it just throws away blocks which are older than that. It's like, oh, this is an outdated old block which is probably already orphaned, or I've heard about it, if it's below the finalized height, I don't need to care about it. So the follower has this notion of latest finalized height. It's useful for the follower. Um, the provider, that is um, the, uh, the engine which provides things to, to other nodes, um, information the execution node has to other nodes, um, that also could have a notion of latest finalized height. Um, it's a little bit of an artificial example, but let, let, let's just roll, roll with it, right? So, um, so you have two components which both have or would like this notion of knowing what the latest finalized height is, and you can do two things. Either you can have one information source, right, which is always atomically updated, um, and both components always have to query that information source. That, that creates congestion. And um, it also creates a problem is if that information source changes, like latest finalized height changes, um, and the follower needs to do something in response to that, like for instance, prune some caches. We do that relatively uh, frequently. Oh, the latest finalized height has changed. Now I can throw away 
all those blocks which are in my memory cache which are below that, right? So if the latest finalized height changes, the follower needs to do something. So if you have one, one information source for that latest finalized height and all the components are querying that source, um, you also need some sort of loopback channel saying, oh, my latest finalized height has changed um, from, from that component um, to the follower to trigger the follower to do its cleanup. Right, so you 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 again get a tight coupling. Um, so now let's do a s similar thought experiment and assume that the follower and the provider are both keeping their own local version of latest finalized height. They subscribe to an event which says, "Hey, this is the latest finalized block," and whenever they get that event, they get that locally. Right? Um, then then they update their, their their local copy of latest finalized height. So that could mean that the follower says, oh, my late, the value I have for latest finalized height is H2, while the provider says, oh, my latest value is H1, so they're different, right? But the benefit is now that since the follower essentially maintains this value along with its cache and all the other local values it maintains, when it gets that new information, finalized height has changed. Um, it can process that and atomically update all its local state in accordance with finalized height. So the the information might come in a little bit later, right? But the the follower itself can make sure that all its local information is atomically consistent, and it doesn't need to care about what any other components have um, for their local information. So. Um, and uh, so again, this design pattern decreases decreases coupling of components. It decreases the need for atomic state consistency between components. Um, and we're moving to an eventually consistent design, right? Eventually, the follower and the provi provider will have the same value once they've gotten the events and updated their local state, right? But they don't always have to. This relaxation um, of saying they don't always have to have the same value allows you to, to build a lot less uh, or a lot weaker coupling between those, right? You just emit the events, oh, finalized block has changed, and the follower and the provider consume this whenever they have space, whenever they have um, available threats to, to consume that event, they'll consume that event and update their local state um, atomically. Um, so that means that sort of the atomicity the, um, yeah, the atomicity moves within the component. It's localized within the component. There's no atomic state or very little atomic state sort of updates um, which affect multiple components. Um, and yeah, and so this eventually consistent design um, allows you to strongly reduce the complexity or of how your components interact. Um, it, it sort of encapsulates complexity within the components and makes them slightly more complex, but it reduced, dramatically reduces the overall complexity of the system. Um, and so this is my recommendation, that it's totally fine for components to locally maintain overlapping sections of state, right? Like the example being latest finalized height here, that multiple components uh, maintain the same conceptually the same value right but they maintain their their own local copy of it um, so don't don't be shy to 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 have redundancy of state in your system in an eventually consistent uh, in an eventually consistent manner all right great uh, uh, sorry questions is is that is that all good um, Okay, seems like um, everyone followed. Okay, so in this eventually consistent design, the pitfall is a little bit the recovery, right? Um, because like um, if, if, uh, if you have components like the follower and the provider and they crash, right? You, you somehow need to, to, to boot them up and recreate that, that local internal state, you know, and you might have missed, even if you write your latest finalized height for the follower in the database, it has its own database key entry where it says my local finalized height is X, right? What happens if this entire thing crashes and you've missed the notification about a new finalized block? 
then you need to you need to fix that during during recovery. Um, so, um, and um, there are a few relatively simple rules which allow you to uh, to do to deal with this problem of recovery um, in a quite uniform way across the code base. Um, so the um, the first recommendation is use simple events that can can easily be queried from the from the protocol state. Um, so the la latest finalized height, for instance, that's some that's something you can easily query from the protocol state. You can say when you boot up and you want to instantiate your your scheduler in the execution node, you can run a database query and say what is the latest value of finalized height, right? And we'll, for instance, say I don't know a thousand. Yeah. Um, and your um, and then you can look at your own uh, at your own value if you have it and say oh I only got to block 900, 990, right? So um, I received all the events up to block, block 990. I know that I, for instance, have executed all results up to this point, right? Um, but I've, due, uh, due to the crash, a few events got lost. Um, and so the uh, and and the system or the database is now at already block a thousand so executable blocks for instance right if the execution node is trying to uh, to queue up all the all the blocks it still needs to execute maybe the last one it has executed was 980 and um, uh, and each time it says a new block has been added you might remember earlier in the talk I talked on the uh, I talked about the on block incorporated event, which the consensus follower emits, essentially notifying other components that a new block is, has arrived, right? So you can uh, imagine that the execution node consumes those on block incorporated event, and each time when it gets one of those events, it says, oh, there's a new block, which I should add to my sort of block execution queue, right? And so when it crashes, it could, for instance, here in this example, it would be in, uh, in state that it has executed up to block 980, um, and but the block and latest block incorporated event was already a thousand. Right. So so there's catch up work to do. You can easily figure that out when you boot up your 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 your, uh, your scheduler or your queuing component. Um, you can easily uh, f figure that out how many blocks you still have to queue by just querying the database. That works if the events are, are are simple and they correspond to to some information stored in the database. Um, so you can figure out what you've lost. Um, so that's first part of the yeah the recovery process, figuring out what you've lost. And then the second part we already talked about that is um, tolerate repetitions of stuff you already know. So in this case, right, um, we're booting up. We're saying oh. Um, we've executed everything up to 980. We have all those results in our database, um, but block 1000 is already av available, so I queue all those 10 blocks in between. And now, um, if and and when I and I've, if when I've queued all those blocks, I'm at this point. I can say, okay, now I can accept new events, right? And so the new events might be repetitions. It might tell us, oh, block 998. 999 and block 1000 have just arrived. The consensus follower might re-emit those events. Um, but that's information we already know, right? We already know that block 999, 98, and, and 1000 are processable. They're already in our queue. Those repetitions don't, don't break anything, right? Um, and so uh, if, if you stick to this mindset of information-driven system, um, then, then all those repetitions are no ops, uh, and it's all good. Um, maybe you, re you redo some work. Maybe you execute a block twice uh, during startup. That can happen. Well, that's fine, right? We'll just lose a little bit of time. That's a lot less problematic than having somewhere a saddle buck in the in the system, which causes mainnet issues or requires us weeks long to do uh, weeks long investigations. Um, so. Um, yeah, so the recommendation for the recovery is use simple events um, that you can uh, that you can uh, figure out what what you have missed for your component when it reboots um, and tolerate repetitions, and then recovery usually isn't a problem.
Um, whoops. Yeah, and so we're nearing the end of the presentations. This is the last summary slide here for all the recommendations from the, from the second part for um, the component. So in summary, we only have those three recommendations. Um, it's fine for component to locally maintain overlapping sections of state redundantly, right, in an eventually consistent manner. Um, use simple events that can be queried from the state. Um, during crash recovery, reconstruct um, the local component state before processing any new events. Um, so you kind of end up at that state where you would have been if you'd seen all the events. Um, and then redoing some, potentially redoing some work you've already done um, during the crash recovery is fine. If you execute a block twice, that's of no, no concern, right? It's all deterministic. And um, which nicely ties back in, right? So if you execute a block twice, you might tell a downstream component the same result twice, right? If that downstream component is in, in a, implemented in an information-driven manner, right, it will say, oh, I already know that information. I'm good, right? Uh, so, so doing this consistently throughout the, the system, working in an information-driven mindset is very important. Um, yeah, that's the last part here. Tolerate information you already know or repetitions of information you already know. All right. Quite precise landing, one minute left. Any, any last question? Thank you. All right, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks for, for coming by, thanks for um, yeah, your interest. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we'll have that recording somewhere online. The slides will be online. Um, in the slide, they're also like here. Yeah, I tried. I tried to incorporate links to code. Where is that? Yeah, here. Links to code here at the bottom. You see um, specific links to our GitHub. So if you want to look any look up any of that code and maybe get a broader sense of how this is used, um, examples are there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thursday. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye.